Hello, it's semester one, 2023, and this is a second revision seminar for differential equations, um, either um, for math or for engineers. So both have these content in there. So welcome everyone from both courses. And um, we're gonna be talking about systems of ODEs and the Frobenius method. Okay, here we go. And I haven't put my camera on, of course not. That would be too easy. It'll come. I trust it. You can do it. There we go. All right, so we're going to be talking about systems of ODEs, and um, off we go. I'll probably just do examples. As far as I'm aware, um, we're actually in this course is only in either course. The only ones that actually get you to actually solve without a computer are systems of constant coefficient ODEs. Um, so that's important. And so a system of ODEs, instead of trying to find one function, you're trying to find several functions simultaneously. That's the goal. And so in ordinary ODEs, there's just one function that you're trying to find, um, but in a system there's several functions and they're all, the derivatives of each function can be calculated from the other functions, basically. So the idea is that y1 dashed and y2 dashed and y3 dashed and however many of them there are, are calculated from y1 and y2 and y3 and however many of them there are. That's the idea. So each one of them has a formula involving the other ones. So what you need to do is get it into the format that y1 dashed is something involving y1 and y2 and y3 and however many there are, and y2 dashed is y1, y2, y3 and however many there are, and y3 dashed. Cool. And um, it may be that there will also be x's in here as well. Um, along the way, but if you're very lucky, it will not in, uh, explicitly mention any x's at all, and that'll be great. Um, and so the best ones tend to look like this. Well, I'm up to D. Etc. Cool. And what we do is we write it as a matrix because we're good at that. We spent, you know, an entire year of, of first year writing things as matrices. And so we tend to write something like this as y1 dashed, y2 dashed, etc. equals a great big matrix A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. times y1, y2, and so on. We write it like that. And this is usually called y bold dash is matrix A times y bold on paper. Would you like me to say what you were just saying aloud so that everyone on the video can hear it? Because it might be useful. No? <laughs> That's okay. Point is that anything that you say to someone if they're asking a question might be useful for the people in the future who are watching the video. So it's okay to ask me too. Cool. Yep. And so this is short for this because the this first coordinate of this vector that I multiply here is this times this and this times this and this times this and so on. And that's how it works. And so this is the algebra version of this. The like the symbol version of this. 
sweet. And what you do is you do the classic um, differential equations trick of uh, supposing that the answer is of a certain kind. And so what we're going to suppose um, is that the answer is something like this. We're going to try what would happen if y, which is made of y1 and y2 and however many there are, what if it was equal to some constant times e to the lambda x and some other constant times e to the lambda x all the way down to, and they've all got an e to the lambda x in them. That's what I'm going to assume the answer is. And um, it seems like a wild guess, but it worked for first order differential equations and it worked for um, second order linear differential equations, so let's give it a go. And what they normally do is they pull out the e to the whatevers and write it like this. And that is a weird way of writing a vector times a number. Normally you put the number at the front, but deal with it. Um, it's how we're doing it. And so what we're actually going to do is we're going to try, this is the, the vector version of it, try the y equals a vector times e to the lambda x. Something like that. I don't know if they call it v in the notes, but I'm calling it v now. Okay. And um, cool. And it could be e to the lambda t. It doesn't really matter what the variable is. <clears throat> and when you try this, it turns out that the vector v is an eigenvector of the matrix A, and the number lambda is an eigenvalue of the matrix A. So you don't have to show this bit of the working, but this is how what happens when you do try that. You go y equals v e to the lambda x, and then if you differentiate every coordinate separately, you'll get c1 e to the lambda x times lambda, and c2 e to the lambda x times lambda, because that's what happens when you differentiate every coordinate separately. And so if you do that, you end up with that. And so when you sub in that into the equation we had before, hey, why you get um, lambda v e to the lambda x is a e to the lambda v e to, ah, oh, damn it, e to the lambda x. And so you can divide by the e to the lambda x and you get lambda v equals a v and ta-da, it's eigenvalues. It's lovely. And so therefore, what you need to do is you need to find the eigenvalues and find the eigenvectors and it should give you all these different solutions. So the big theory, which is the same as the theory in all of these things, is that if you can find, um, if this is an n by n matrix back here, if you can find n different eigenvectors, then you can find all the possible solutions by doing linear combinations of them. Which is the same as what we did for second order DEs. If you found it was two different solutions, you could do linear combinations to get all the rest, and it's the same thing now. So the theory goes, If A is n by n, if you can find n different eigenvectors, V1 up to Vn, with eigenvalues lambda 1 up to lambda n, then um, your solutions will be then you get n different solutions. Uh, V1 e to the lambda 1 x all the way up to Vn e to the lambda n x and then all the solutions are something like C1 V1 e to the lambda 1 x plus up to Cn Vn e to the lambda n x like that. Yay. And what this means is that when you multiply all these out, you get a vector of numbers here. Um, oh, that's not going to be, these C's are not the same as those C's. Sorry. 
I shall call them K back here. Sorry about that. Um, when you multiply this and this times all the entries of the vector and all of these times the entries of the vector, you'll be able to get it down to, if you want to, an expression in every coordinate in terms of x. And then that one is what y1 is, and that one is what y2 is, and that one is what y3 is, and so on. So it's important to never forget that even though we've written them as vectors with bold, the ultimate goal was to figure out separately what each of these things was. And so the final answer is technically y1 equals thing, and y2 equals thing, and y3 equals thing. That's really important. How are you feeling about that vibe? I should put the chat on. Okay. So that tells me what the goal, what the whole plan is. The plan is write as a matrix, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, eigenthings, and then do the linear combinations. And if you're very lucky, at the very, very end, after you've done all of that, then you can sub in your, your initial conditions and figure out the final particular solution. Sub in. Um, Actual final answer. Cool. All right, that's the plan. So I should do an example. So the thing is, the thing that makes it really hard is when you get complex numbers as some of your eigenvalues. And there's some technical details that go on there that make it uh, less hard than it sounds getting eigenvalues, but still hard. Uh, so it sounds really hard. But it's not really hard, it's just hard. So just pointing it out. So what I should do is an example of that. All right, so I'll do one that doesn't come out to that problem. Um, Give me a moment. There we go. Of course, you know, whole numbers don't really happen in the wild very often, but that's okay. They happen in exams. Um, let's do that. So I've got y1 dashed is 3 of y1 minus 4 of y2 y2 dashed is y1 minus 2 of y2, um, and y1 of 0 is 10, and y2 of 0 is 0. Cool. And this is the, this sort of situation when it happens is because um, the current values of the two things that you're measuring affect how quickly they change. And the classic is two mixing tanks of some sort of chemicals, something like that, anyway. Um, but you could actually do it um, in a um, biology setting of having the populations of two different animals and they each affect the other one's ability to breed. Um, and then, the rate, oh, oh, and they eat each other. And so that changes the rate of change that they are depending on how many of each of them there is. Okay, so this is where we are. And we first set it up like this. 
So y1 dashed and y2 dashed as a vector is a matrix times y1, the vector y1, y2. And my first row is three of y1 and minus four of y2, which means I put that across like that so that when I multiply this out, I get that. And this one is one and minus two. And if you do set them up so all the y1s are in the first column and all the y2s are in the second column in your equations, it should all just, you should be able to just copy them. Um, there's the suck that they pull sometimes is they don't always put them in the same order and you've just got to pay attention. Um, yeah. Okay. And so we shall call this y dashed and this a and this y. So the first thing we need to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. And I'm not going to skip this step because this is the step that most people have forgotten from Maths 1B. So to find the eigenvalues of a matrix, um, you have to solve lambda i minus a um, times vector equals zero or a minus lambda i. It doesn't matter which one you use. Um, in Maths 1B, it was very often lambda i minus a, but in this course, the lecturer usually does a minus lambda i. I'm sorry, I can't turn off my Maths 1B head. I'm going to solve this first. So the, for the eigenvalues, right, before I do either of those, I just want to write down what lambda i minus a is. No, it really is equal to this. Lambda minus three, four minus one, lambda plus two. That is what lambda i minus a is. And to find the eigenvalues, we have to do the determinant of lambda i minus a being zero. So I'm gonna to have to find this determinant. I just wanna check that I've done this right before I finish off Without the lambdas, it should be the same as minus a. So minus three plus four minus one and plus two. Okay, just checking that I've got it right. All right, so I've got lambda minus three, lambda plus two, minus, minus one times four. <sighs> now to solve that. Hmm. Probably no hope but to expand it out, I suppose. But I protest. So how far are minus three and two apart? Five? No, I don't like it. So lambda squared plus two lambda minus three lambda minus five plus four. And I get lambda squared minus lambda minus one minus five, minus six. six yes two times i added them again didn't i three times six is minus six so that's minus two so if we are extremely lucky we can guess two numbers that multiply to give minus two and add to give minus one um, if they're going to add to give a negative number at least one of them has to be negative so i need a positive number and a negative number so let's see um, well, one and minus two would add to give minus one, and one times minus two would give me minus two. So that's great, awesome. It's almost like I set it up that way to begin with. Um, <laughs> so therefore, lambda i minus a is um, lambda minus one, lambda plus one, and lambda minus two. So this number one goes here as a plus one, this number minus two goes here as a minus two. And so therefore, I'm supposed to set this equal to zero, and so therefore lambda is minus one or two. Sweet. If you have other ways of solving that quadratic equation, go for it. The quadratic formula would have worked. That's what it's for. Um, it is specially designed to solve quadratic equations, uh, but note that your lecturers are very likely to set it up so that it either factorizes or 
the completing the square is easy. So you do what you do you. That's fine. Okay. And so now that I've got the eigenvalues, now I have to put them back into this equation and solve that equals zero. Zero, zero, the vector. Now I know in advance what the eigenvector for one one for minus one is going to be because I set my matrix up to do this specially, um, but I don't know what it is for two yet. So, all right. Just before I move on, questions or thoughts at this time? Yep. Yep. A minus lambda i would have been fine. Um, it just would have ended up with um, no. It would have been fine. Um, yeah, if it was a three by three matrix, the a minus lambda i would have a minus at the front instead of a plus. And that just causes slight amount of pain for factorizing. You're asking just for the video. Is it possible we have to do the determinant of three by three matrix in the exam? I don't know. <laughs> if I were the lecturer, I wouldn't do that in my exam because I'd have to mark it. <laughs> but. <laughs> that's that's just me. I don't know what sort of psychopaths you have as your lecturers. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is theoretically possible, but um, most reasonable people wouldn't do that to you or themselves. So, um, okay. So if lambda is minus one, then I have to put that number minus one back here where the lambda is in this equation. So I have minus 1, minus 3, 4, minus 1, and minus 1, plus 2. So I put minus 1 into this, and then my goal is actually to solve for when that's equal to 0, 0. And if it really is an eigenvector, you are guaranteed to get a free variable. And for a 2 by 2 matrix, Guaranteeing a free variable guarantees that one row is a multiple of the other. And look, the top row is um, minus four, is four times the bottom row. And so I can do row operations here. Um, I can do row operations to get to here. I don't even have to tell the reader what the, multiple, what the row operations are, but just so you know, the row operations are um, switch row one and row two, do minus row one and then do row two is row one plus four of row two. But you don't have to show those row operations. You know this one's a multiple of that one, so you can make it zeros and then you can swap them and do the minuses and it'll all work out fine. Um, and so I get a free variable here. This is more possibly not how the lecturer does it, but this is how I do it because that's what we did in Mass 1A. So this one is T. The second one is T. Um, I shouldn't call it y because we've already used y, haven't we? x2, it's probably y, who cares? Um, x2 is t and x1 is therefore also t because I moved this over here to get a plus 1. And so I've got that x1, x2 is t, t, which is t lots of 1, 1. And it makes not the slightest difference what t is because you only need one of these. And so I've got for lambda equals minus one, my eigenvector that I choose is one, one. Cool. All right, and I set up my matrix to be, have that eigenvector to begin with. And now I have to do for lambda equals, I might even go to a whole new page to do that because it's not gonna fit in anyway. For lambda equals the other one, I have to come back here and go 2 minus 3, 4 minus 1, 2 plus 2. And so that's minus 1, 4, minus 1, 4. Oh, look at that. Each one, the second row is the first row, and so I can get to here. And so this time, I'm going to get a t for this one and a 4t for this one. So if this variable is t, then I've got 
x1 is minus 4t, mi minus 4t is 0, and so therefore x1 equals 4t. Do you know what I should? Well, that's how I do it in my head. I line them up with the column that they're in. Um, and so my eigenvector is 4t t, which is t lots of 4, 1. And so for lambda equals 2, choose the eigenvector 4, 1. Okay. And so now I've got my eigenvectors and the matching eigenvalues, my two solutions that I'm going to combine together. Um, and so actually I should have written it back here. The solution that goes with this is that y is equal to um, 1, 1 e to the minus x. And the solution that goes with this is y equals 4, 1 e to the 2x. Because you take this vector and you times it by e to the power of that x. And so all my solutions will be uh, y equals something times, and it doesn't, you don't have to use c if you don't want to. I find them confusing. Um, so I'm just going to call it like a of. Um, 1, 1, e to the minus x, and b of 4, 1, e to the 2x. And that is the answer. So if I didn't have these, I would stop there. That would be the end. But I do have those, and so I have one extra step to do. So let's see, y 1 of 0 was 10, and y 2 of 0 was 0. And that means that the vector y1, y2 when the variable x is 0 is 10, 0. So I can actually say it like this. The vector y at 0 is 10, 0. I can write it as a vector. It's just a little easier to do. So back here, just going to copy what I had. You don't have to copy it, but just because they're on separate pages, it's easier for me to process what's going on. So y of 0 from this equation is a times 1, 1, e to the 0, plus b times 4, 1, e to the 0, which is just a times 1, 1 plus b times 4, 1. Are you ready for magic trick number two? I love this magic trick. When you do a linear combination of some vectors, it's the same as multiplying a matrix by a column. So we have 1, 1 and 4, 1, and we have a of column 1 and b of column two. That was a thing from maths one a, which was, you know, some amount of time ago. But you can also say, look, it's, it's a plus four b and a plus b and make this equation like that. And so this answer is supposed to be equal to 10, zero. And so what I have to solve is one, for 10 and 1, 1, 0. And that will tell me what the correct choices are for A and B. Oh, look, more row operations. I'm going to stop for a second. How are we feeling? Yeah? What do you mean? Oh, sure. You don't have to use matrix inverses if you don't want. Yeah, do not. That's sick. That's my best. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, he probably did that because he was gearing up to do the Ronskian later. Because <laughs> the Ronskian is the... Yeah. So when, when you do the uh, variation of parameters... 
you solve one of these but with functions in these spots. And so row operations aren't really a thing. Um, yeah, so I would do these row operations. I would swap these two rows. And then I would do row one. Row two is row two minus row one. And then I divide by that three. And then I would do row, oh, damn it, I always run out of space. And then I would do row one minus row two. And yay. You could also have um, literally just, you know, gone, oh, well, look, A is minus B and sub that into the other one and get equations that way if you wanted. There are many ways to do this. But if, you're going to, if we're going to spend a whole year making you do row operations, you should be allowed to keep using them forever. That's, that's my plan. And if you do numerical methods next semester, your lecturer is going to constantly say, do not ever invert a matrix if you can help it. So there we go. And so the A is really minus 10 thirds, and the B is, that's what A and B are, and the B is 10 thirds. And so my final, final solution is now, so Y is actually, uh, A was minus 10 thirds of 1, 1, E to the minus X, and B was 10 thirds of 4, 1, E to the 2 X. That's what I get. And actually, technically, you're supposed to tell people what Y1 and Y2 are separately. So I should probably put this all together into one um, thing. So we get minus 10 thirds times one times E to the minus X. And this one's 10 thirds times four um, E to the two X. And this one is minus 10 thirds times one E to the minus X. And this one is 10 thirds times 1 e to the 2x. And that is what y1 and y2 are, those two functions. Which means that now that I actually have them as a functions, I could go and put them into some machine and get it to graph them for me if I wanted. Yeah. And as x goes to infinity, um, these bits won't matter so much. And so you'll end up with something like that. And you will end up with um, the value of y1 being approximately four times the value of y2 as x goes to infinity. I don't know if this is a thing. Do they do this sort of thing? All right, anyway, it's a thing um, that you can now say, what would happen if x goes to infinity? And you can say, well, a cool y1 divided by y2 is about four. Um, I don't, yeah. It's a thing I've seen before, but it could have been more than three years ago when the curriculum changed. So, yeah. How are we feeling about all of that? Cool. All right. Example number two. It's going to take me a moment to get it right. Oh, come on. Okay, I have it. Oh, 
like this. I may put some initial conditions in here. But I might decide what they are later. Okay. Okay. So just leave a space. I'll put these numbers in later when I see what the answer is. Um, still remember the DE's lecturer who uh, told me that her plan was to write her exam as write down some differential equations you know you can solve and solve them. <laughs> but she decided not to at the last minute. And <laughs> You know, there'll be points for difficulty, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, okay, so I can do my setup that the bold y is 655 five minus 2 um, y dashed times bold y, something like that. Um, and this is my matrix A. And then I have to do the thing where I find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So my eigenvalues are, um, <clears throat> let's see, lambda i minus a is minus a and then lambdas. And so the determinant of lambda i minus a is lambda minus 6, lambda plus 2, minus, minus 5 times minus 5. I'm just going to put them in, or I'm just going to get it wrong. Hmm, okay. Just copying the previous line, the last line from the previous page. Oh, I am going to turn that into a 25. So I could expand it out and attempt to factorize it. You know I've made them complex numbers, so you're not going to be able to factorize it. Um, but um, I, I do want to show you something fun because this is fun. Halfway between minus 6 and 2. Um, is minus 2. Like if I average them, minus 6 plus 2 is, um, is minus 4, and then divide by 2 is minus 2. So halfway between them is, um, is minus 4, is minus 2. This is minus 2, minus 4. And this is minus 2 plus 4. And now this is the difference of two squares. Thing minus 4, thing plus 4, it must be the same as thing squared minus 4 squared. Isn't that fun? And I think I have made, I have made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> cool, yay me. Um, maybe that 25 should have been a different number. Oh, damn it, David. I need um, one of these fives to be a minus five. Minus five. It's like that's a minus five, that makes that a plus five, that makes that a plus five, and that makes this a plus 25. Okay, sorry about that. And so I get lambda minus two squared. Um, 25 minus 16 is nine. 
I've made it very friendly for us. So this is not going to be ever equal to zero because this thing is a positive number. And so there are no real solutions. But if I want this to be equal to zero, I will get lambda minus two squared is minus nine. And so therefore lambda minus two is plus or minus three i because I'll square root the nine to get three, plus or minus three, and I'll square root the minus one to get i. And so my lambda is two plus or minus three i. It's a fun trick, doesn't always work, but I like it um, as a trick. Otherwise, you can expand it out. You know, I, I will say, you know, or expand out and use the quadratic formula. <laughs> that will also work. <laughs> also be fine. I do warn you that if you use the quadratic formula, um, yeah, there are minuses. There are places to go wrong. <laughs> Okay, so here I am, I've got these two solutions. And that means that officially I'm supposed to figure out what the eigenvector is that goes with two plus three i and the eigenvector that goes with two minus three i and those will be complex and I don't really want them to be complex because what I really want them is for them to be real. And so I have to, among all of, and then so when I join them together and doing this final step here where I do the C, that you know, the A of one plus the B of the other, um, I have to, among all of those complex number answers, I have to pick out the real ones. And wow, that's a lot of work. Luckily, people have been doing this for a couple of hundred years um, and they have figured out that it is easier than that. What you have to do is find the eigenvector that goes with one of these two solutions, it doesn't matter which one, um, and find the eigenvector that goes with it, which will be a complex eigenvector, and then find the real bit and the imaginary bit, and they are the two solutions you're going to use instead. So you don't have to worry about them both. So I'm just going to have a quick look. I reckon I'll do lambda um, with two plus three i is my choice. You're allowed to choose the other one. Um, sometimes which one of them is easier, but I was going to avoid the minus if I could. And so my lambda i minus a, here it is. So I'm going to have two plus three i minus six I'm just going to write it in, and a 5, and a minus 5, and a 2 plus 3i plus 2. And technically, I'm supposed to be solving for this being 0, 0. That's my goal. And so what I've got is minus 4 plus 3i, and 5, and minus 5, and 4 plus 3i. And if this complex number really is an eigenvector, but eigenvalue, sorry, then one of these rows should be a multiple of the other. It does not look like it at the moment. But complex numbers are create, yeah, <laughs> complex. They have more than one part to them. They're complicated. So not just complex, but complicated. Um, and um, they can do more than that. So um, I decide so just see what will happen if I multiply um, one of these rows by the other. So I do notice something. These two here um, are the same, except that one bit of it's negative and the other bit's positive. So if I multiply this top row by four plus three i, it should do the conjugate thingamajig and cancel out to be real. So watch this, row one times four plus three i, just to be absolutely certain that everything's working the way it should. So minus four plus three i times plus four plus three i would be, um, it's a difference of two squares, right? It's three i plus or minus four. So it'll be, I'm just gonna write it around this way. 
3i minus 4, 3i plus 4. That's the same thing. And so I'll get 3i squared, which is 3 squared, which is 9, and i squared, which is minus 9. I'll get minus 9 and minus um, 4 times 4, um, which is 16, which is minus 25. I get that. All right. And 5 times 4 plus 3i is 5 times 4 plus 3i. I'm just going to leave it like that. Look, this is 5 times minus 5 here. And this is 5 times 4 plus 3i. So if I times row 1 by 4 plus 3i, I get 5 times the bottom row. So I've got 5 times minus 5 and 5 times 4 plus 3i, which is 5 times row 2. Cool. Row 2 is a multiple of row 1 and vice versa. And so I can safely know for sure that that really was an eigenvalue. You don't have to do this bit if you don't want. If you want to just trust yourself and just run with it, you can just know that one of them has to be a multiple of the other and just make one of them go away. That would be fine. If you trusted all of your previous calculations, but this is, this is a check, right? And so that is 5 row 2, so that's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick whichever row um, appeals to me the most um, and keep that one. I choose this row. So officially the row operation I've done is row 2 um, minus 4 plus 3i fifths of row 1, something like that. But doesn't really matter. So shortcut is you're allowed to just do this. If it really is an eigenvalue, then you can do that. Won't work for a 3 by 3 matrix, but totally will for a 2 by 2. But 3 by 3 and complex um, eigenvalues, that would be like the worlds of pain for everybody. So we're not going to do that. I, I would, if I were the marker for that, I would protest against the lecturer so hard. <laughs> yeah, so I refuse to mark this exam. <laughs> Everyone gets 100%. Maybe they should do it. <laughs> anyway, here we are. We're going to need a one in one of those spots. It doesn't matter which one of them it is. And so I choose to put it here. I'm just going to leave it like this. And so instead of making the free variable this one, I'm going to make it this one because that's where the pivot column is. So I've got that x1 is free and x2 is um, minus one fifth of minus four plus three i times t. And I could just as easily have multiplied them by five and that would have been great. And so this is just, I, I can't think about it in any other way than this. And so my x1, x2, is t lots of 1 and minus a fifth of minus 4 plus 3i. And then if I times that whole thing by minus 5, that will be a really good way of getting rid of that fraction. So um, cool. Ultimately, I will do a shortcut for you in a second. Um, and so I have that for lambda equals, um, what was it, 2 plus 3i? Um, I choose the eigenvector minus 5 minus 4 plus 3i. Um, I want you to notice something, if I can fit them both on the screen at the same time. Uh, the number for x1 is minus the number for x2. Like back here that this second one ended up minus in the first coordinate and that first one ended up as it is in the second coordinate that'll always happen you can switch these two and minus one of them and that will be a perfectly good eigenvector 
Yeah. <laughs> so shortcut, and we could have done it way back here, even in the other one. I switch these two and minus one of them, I get four one. Yep. I think you can use the shortcut. I mean, the lecturers not once showed you the entire of the, the eigenvalue eigenvector process ever, right? <laughs> so, like, and it's not like you've asked someone else to do it. You're in an exam. Like, where would you have gotten that from? So it came out of your head. And so the shortcut process, I should probably write that down so it's actually on the page somewhere. Shortcut. Um, if you have um, A, B, zero, zero, then a solution is minus b a or if you like b minus a it doesn't really matter which one you want i just switch them and minus one of them i recommend minusing whichever one has a negative in it already cool just for future reference I have never written this shortcut and spoken about it that way in a revision seminar ever. Um, now that I've said it, I can try and remember it for the future. But it always works out that way because you can always do the move that I did. Yeah. All right. Cool. And so we are now at this stage. We know that a solution that goes with this is minus 5 minus 4 plus 3i e to the 2 plus 3i x. You might want to turn your mic off. Cool. <laughs> There was a revision seminar, revision seminar a couple of years ago where I had my computer muted. And so there were a couple of people talking to each other the entire seminar and it got recorded and I didn't know and I couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> so I had this running commentary on, on uh, what I was saying. You can go find it if you want, but anyway. So this is that A solution. And this is a complex solution, which is bad because we only wanted the real answers. And so what we have to do is pull from this a real part and an imaginary part, which will both be real, because the imaginary part you shave off the eye. Um, and they are my two solutions that I'm going to use instead. So I'm going to have to turn this into something that I can find a real part and an imaginary part of. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is this. Multiply this x by both of these, and then I'll have e to the 2x plus, and e to, and e to the 2x plus 3ix, and then plus up here is times down below. And then this is a real number now that is times by everything else, so it can stay out the front for the entire rest of the process. I'm going to move it all the way over here. And this, according to Euler, is cos of 3x plus i times sine of 3x. That is Euler's formula. This is, in fact, what the definition of e to the something times i is. Like, it's what it has to be, or the entire complex um, arithmetic doesn't work properly. So, yeah. And so now I can multiply this out. I'll leave the e to the 2x there. It's not going to make any difference. And I'll have minus 5 times this, which is minus 5 cos of 3x minus 5i sine of 3x. 
and then I have this times this, which is two things multiplied by two things. I'm going to have to expand it, the, um, the multiplication with the brackets. So I'll have minus 4 cos of 3x and minus 4i sine of 3x. I'm just going to put a line there so that I can tell the difference between the two parts of the, the vector. And then the second, um, and then I'm going to get um, 3i times cos of 3x, and I'm going to put that here. And 3i times i times sine of 3x, which is minus 3. So just pointing out that this entire thing is in the second coordinate. I'm going to put a box around the two of them so that it's easier to tell where the first coordinate and the second coordinate are. If you feel uncomfortable writing a two-line thing inside one coordinate of a vector, it's okay to say first coordinate equals, second coordinate equals. But I've, re I've been very careful about the way I've written this. Um, I would have possibly written the three i times this on this side, but I moved it over here so it lined up with the other things that have i's in them. And so, if I multiply this out, I'll get e to the two x times this and e to the two x times this, and the real part is that, and the imaginary part is that, without the i's. And so, two real solutions are e to the 2x times minus 5 cos 3x and minus 4 cos 3x minus 3 sine 3x. And, and it's on the next page, I'm sorry. Cliffhanger, um, e to the 2x. And then I take this bit without, but without the eyes minus 5 sine of 3x and minus 4 sine of 3x plus 3 cos of 3x, like that. Oh, you don't have to the eyes nope. I'm removing the eyes entirely because I'm finding the imaginary part, which is the coefficient of i. If you want. No one really cares. I mean, you could say the real and imaginary, if you want. So the real part and the imaginary part. Um, not the worst plan. If you, if you don't have time, you can just tell the reader what you're going to do. You say, two real, the two real solutions are the real part and the imaginary part of this. And if you don't have time to write them down, at least they know that you know what you were going to do. And it might make the difference between passing and failing or between a credit and a distinction. You should always think of those things. Um, if, if one mark will make a difference between one, a grade band and another grade band, they'll usually go looking for it um, in your exam. Or you can make them go looking for it after the fact. <laughs> But they don't want that conversation, and so they'll usually go finding it if they can. Okay, and so those are our two solutions, and all the other solutions will be some number times this plus some number times this. So it's not technically rest necessary to write this line down because it's a bit of a waste of time, but in my head, it's there. And so I will get um, the general solution is y equals something times this times that and something times that. No, I'm committed. Right, and at this stage, if you had some initial conditions, you'd sub them in at this point. Um, and it's really nice because cos of zero is one and sine of zero is zero. But I don't choose to do that at this time. So, um, 
because I would then have to solve like we did before with the row operations and blah, blah, blah. And I just don't want to. So, yeah. But basically what happens is when you sub in zero, anything with a sign will disappear and anything with, with, with a cos will become a one. Um, and so, just a second. So just want to point out that y of zero will be a times one minus five times one minus four times one and that's a zero there plus b e to the zero is one uh, minus five times zero is zero and we'll get a three like that and so um, when you actually get your initial conditions you'll be solving this matrix now yeah cool Final thoughts or questions? Yep. I'm not sure what you mean. Can you show it to me? <laughs> Like that. And then they said, let theta one be theta and theta two be theta dash. Okay. If you haven't done this, look away. <laughs> um, so this is officially a reduction of order sort of thing. And so you'll look at this one and see that that is theta two dashed. And then this is theta one and theta one. And so you end up with um, theta two dash. And so, um, and the other thing we'll notice is that theta one dashed um, well, theta one dashed is theta dashed which is theta two. And so we would get theta one dashed equals thing and theta two dashed equals thing. And now that's a system of linear in, in linear ODEs, not linear. It's just a system of ODEs. They're not linear, but that's what they are. So theta two dashed is and theta one, damn it, theta Damn it. Theta one dash is theta two. And that is a system of ODEs now. If they're not linear, so I can't do the matrix thing with them, but it is a system because it says that each of the derivatives on the left hand side is made of the not derivatives on the right hand side. Cool. I don't know how to solve that, but that's what they <laughs> So you can see we've got y dashed is made of y on this side, basically. Okay, awesome. I'm glad we covered that. And now it is time for And now it is time for the Frobenius method. Actually, I may just have uh, some water.
After 11 revision seminars and a half, my voice is Okay, so on my rough version of the, the handout for second order linear ODEs, um, <laughs> Frobenius method is uh, here. <laughs> and if we follow that back, it's for polynomial coefficient second-order homogeneous DEs. <laughs> yes! Okay. <laughs> I have a theory it would work for any order linear ODEs, but... Um, Polynomial coefficient, so linear polynomial coefficient, second order, homogeneous <laughs> ODEs. That's what it's for. And what that means is they always look like this. Something times y double dash plus something times y dash plus something times y equals zero, where these things are all polynomials. And just to point out, a polynomial is allowed to just be a single number, also allowed to be zero. So anything with, with single numbers or x's or x squareds or whatever, that's what it's for. And it is... Um, specifically designed for um, poly, um, differential equations where x where zero is a regular singular point so if you rearrange this into y double dash is something times y dash and it's something times y equals zero and divide everything by ax This is the standard form, it's called. So I just want to point something out. In order to decide if you're allowed to use Frobenius's method, you have to put it in standard form. But in order to actually use Frobenius's method, you have to keep it in the original form. Right. So this is for using it. This is for deciding if you're allowed to use it. And you are allowed to, so it is for linear polynomial coefficients, second order homogeneous ODEs. But so is the power series method. Um, and this is adjusted for ones that the power series method doesn't work for. So we need zero to be a regular singular point. So we need x equals zero to be a. regular singular point. So to be singular, it must be that px and or q of x aren't defined when x is zero. Officially, they're not analytic, but not defined will do the trick. So to be singular, you need p of x or q of x or both um, to not have a derivative um, when x is zero. Actually, it just has to not have all of its derivatives when x is zero. So they have to not be analytic. But ultimately, it usually comes out to them to be undefined for x equals zero. That's what a singular point is. And to be a regular singular point, even though p of x and q of x are undefined when x equals zero, it's only because one of them um, is because they have an x on the bottom, which is why things are undefined. But you need um, the p of x to have 
at most one x on the bottom, and the q of x is allowed to have two of them. And so um, you need that x times p of x and x squared times q of x to be defined. And I say defined, but officially it's actually analytic. That's the official word that you're supposed to use. Um, you can be defined and still not be analytic. Analytic means that you have to be able to differentiate it infinitely many times and always get an answer that makes sense. I, even if the answer is zero. Zero is a great makes sense answer. <laughs> um, so polynomials are automatically analytic. Either or, or both. And or, yeah, doesn't matter which one. If either of them is undefined, it makes it singular. So ultimately, when you put it in this format, if the q of x has an x squared on the bottom and the p of x has an x on the bottom, you'll be fine. Um, but it's totally okay if the q of x has an x on the bottom and the p of x doesn't have anything because that's all right, because if you times by x squared, it'll be okay. Um, but this is the official rule. So if someone says, is zero a regular singular point, then you will say, uh, well, p of x is undefined when x is zero, um, but x times p of x and x squared times p of x are these formulas which um, are analytic. So the official word you're supposed to use is analytic. Um, but in this context, the ones that they give you and the ones that are going to be possible to solve using Frobenius's method, it, analytic, analytic is the same as defined um, for these kinds of things because they're rational functions because we made them by dividing polynomials. Because this process only works if these are polynomials. So, yeah. Officially, it can work with other ones, but then you have to have like Taylor series times other Taylor series, and it's just the worst. Uh, and I'm almost certain um, that Frobenius, sorry? Oh no, he's never even shown anything like that, right? So um, I'm almost certain that Frobenius didn't know about that. So, okay, so here we are. That's when you're allowed to do it. You need these things to be true. If P or Q is not undefined at x equals zero, then you use the ordinary power series method. Um, if it's not a singular point at all, power series. And if it's an irregular singular point, well, pick a different point, and instead of x to the n, do x minus one to the n instead. Um, yeah, but that's the rule. Technically, you can do all of this with power series that don't have x, but have x minus c, like a Taylor series centered at a different point, and you can do that instead. Um, yeah. Okay, cool, just so we know. And it's easiest to do it um, by describing, am I going to describe the steps? Well, you go, so again, classic move in differential equations, try something and we're going to try y is equal to x to the r times m equals zero, uh, the sum from m equals zero to infinity of x to the m. Um, and there's an am there somewhere as well. And then we are going also, we're going to assume that a naught is not zero. That's an important part of the process. Um, and this is the same as this. Uh, and the key thing is that the R doesn't necessarily have to be a whole number. It may be um, negative, it may be like three quarters, could be anything. In fact, the Fabinius's method is best when the R, um, when the two answers for R that we get aren't a whole number apart. So, yeah. Okay, and then you differentiate it, you sub it in, and some stuff happens. 
Um, and the earliest term in your power series that you get to the end um, will be will tell you what R is. And then you pick your R and sub it in, and then you can figure out what a mm, recurrence relation is. And so um, sub in to the DE, into the original DE, not to the standard form. And if it was already in standard form, you'd multiply it out so that they're all polynomials. Um, polynomial coefficients. Um, and then fiddle around um, and find the earliest m that appears anywhere in any of the sums that are involved, um, the coefficient of x to the m plus r for that will produce the indicial equation. And that will tell you what r is. I will do it in an example. <laughs> um, and that will be the initial equation, which will tell you what R is. And then um, all the other coefficients um, will give you a, you, it may be that there's another M that gives you a whole separate equation. And then at some point there'll be um, a occurrence relation. And if you are the luckiest person in the world, your recurrence relation will be recognizable, but in general it's not. But that's okay, because most differential equations, you don't really care what the later terms are anyway, um, because x is usually quite a small number, and so you just want the first few anyway. That's for practical purposes. And in lots of exams, they just say, write out the first three non-zero terms, or something like that. Okay, that's the plan. That is Frobenius's method. And I will do an example. And I may possibly make one up. This differential equation. Now let's just check. This is linear because the y double dash and the y dash and the y only, only appear once each and they're each multiplied by something and added together. That's what linear means. Um, the coefficients are polynomials. It is second order and it is homogeneous. So Frobenius method is something that should ought to, well, power series or Frobenius's method is something that ought to work. Um, and x is a singular point because the standard form is Um, y double dash plus x squared minus 1 on x, y dash plus 3 on x, y equals 0. And both of these are undefined when x is 0. So px is x squared minus 1 on x, which is undefined for x equals 0. And qx is 3 on x which is undefined for x equals zero. But x times p of x is just x squared minus one, which is fine. That's analytic. And x squared times q of x is three x, which is analytic. And so therefore x equals zero is a regular singular point and I'm allowed to use Frobenius's method. So it's regular, so it's singular. Because of this, and it's regular because of this. How are we feeling? Cool. Nice. And so therefore, Frobenius's method is OK. They don't even call it Frobenius's, they just call it Frobenius, the Frobenius method, don't they? 
might be a little at the end. <laughs> there may be one at the end. Okay. And so we will try y equals m equals zero to infinity a m x to the m plus r. But it's useful to know you can bring the x to the r in and out of that. Um, and in order to try this, we're going to have to differentiate it and sub it in. So I'm going to leave a gap after this in order to do some index shifting at some point. So So if I differentiate it, each term separately, I'll have to multiply by the current exponent and make the exponent go down by one. And then if I differentiate it again, oh no, nope, I'm not gonna leave a gap, but it's too late. I'll leave a gap later. Um, if I differentiate it again, I will get this. And this first bit of the working is always the same. Damn it, I've written it too wide. So when I differentiate this one, I'll multiply by the current exponent and that will go down by another one and get down to minus two. And so these are my three derivatives. And I would like to sub these into this. I choose not to write this out and then put all of these sums in a big thing that's going to take several lines to write. I, I refuse. So I'm going to figure out what all these things are. So here we go. X times Y double dash would be this times X. And if I times this by X, well, multiplying by x to the power of 1 would add 1 to this power and make this go up by 1. And so I'm going to get this sum. And I am going to leave a gap this time, just in case. And I'm going to have to multiply y dash by both x squared and by minus 1, so I'm going to do them separately x squared times y dashed. So if I times this by x squared, it's gonna go up by two and it'll be x for m plus r plus one, because it's gonna go up by two. Not much for gap, but it'll be okay. And I'm gonna to have to do minus one times y dashed as well, and that's equal to this. So this thing here times minus one. I know this may seem like overkill, but it's just easier for me if I do it this way. And the last thing in my thing is I'm gonna need three of y. And so that's this. So now I have all of these things. These are all of the things that appear in my differential equation. My differential equation had x, y double dashed, which is here, and it had x squared, y dashed, which is here, and it had minus 1 times y dashed, which is here, and it had 3 times y, which is here. And all four of these things, when I add them together, are supposed to come out to zero. So if I was paying a lot of attention, I could probably remove these equals as here and put plus, 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 and it would all be good, but it's just easier this way. Okay. So I have an issue. My first, there are two issues. My first issue is that I'm going to want to figure out the coefficients of x to the power of m plus r or x to the power of anything, right? And so I'm going to need all of these to match each other. They're going to have to be the same. And so I'm going to have to move some of them. It doesn't matter which ones I move. I can move some of them forward and some of them backward. It doesn't matter. It'll all work out in the end. Um, don't worry about there being an m equals minus 1. It'll be fine. It'll just get times by 0 anyway, and so no one cares. So it'll be fine. And so I'm going to have to shift some indexes. That's what this process I'm about to do is called. Because this m is called an index. 
because an index tells you where things where where things are. That's what an index in a book is for. Is this tells me where I am in my series. Okay. Also, it's from the this finger is your index finger. Index means pointing. The, it points at the different terms in the series. In case you were wondering where the word comes from. Huh, yay. So in another land, in computer science, instead of calling things pointers, they would have called them indices. But um, computer scientists are not that um, snobby. So, <laughs> Sorry? They already had indexes. Ah, uh, yeah. I should have qualified them with an adjective. <laughs> like we did here, you know? Linear polynomial coefficient constant order second order homogeneous ODEs, right? Just call that a pointer of memory index. Yes, let's do it. Oh, you can tell I've done 12, 12, nearly 12 revision seminars. We're losing it. Um, so here we are. I want to make them all match, and I want to do it by moving as few of them as possible. I'm going to have to move at least two of them. I choose to move this one and this one to make them all m plus r minus one. So if I want this to be an m plus r minus one, I'm gonna to need to take two off of here, which means I'm gonna to have to add two here. So I'm gonna to add two to all the m's here, and I'm gonna take two off of all of these m's. So I am going to write it like this. So this m got a minus 2, this m got a minus 2, and this m got a minus 2. Um, so this m got a minus 2, which produced this. This m got a minus 2, which produced this. This m got a minus 2, which produced this. And to compensate for the fact that we added it to, to we subtracted 2 from all these m's, we added 2 to all of these m's. And that cancels it out. That is what index shifting is. Okay, and then down here, I need this to be a minus one. So I'm gonna to have to take one from these and add one to these. Oh cool, I don't need to zoom out very far. So now these are my things that I'm adding together. Just to make absolutely clear that we can see all the things that we're adding together, we have this thing, which has an m plus r minus 1, and we have this thing, which has an m plus r minus 1, and we have this thing, which has an m plus r minus 1, and we have this thing, which has an m plus r minus 1. Those four things together, when I add them all together, are supposed to produce zero and not just zero the zero function the thing that is zero no matter what the value of x is that's the important thing regardless of what x is this equation is supposed to come out to zero in fact this equation okay so the total should be zero. That is how I'm going to write this down. The total is the zero function. We know this to be true. I am not going to write down this sum plus this sum plus this sum plus this sum equals zero. I'm just going to write down the words the total is zero. Okay. And that means that the coefficient of every x to the power of in this total is also zero coefficient of x to the um, m plus r minus 1 is 0 for every m. That's important too. That's what that means. And so I'm going to look at my list and decide which 
M's and work through my values of M one at a time. Infinitely many of them. All right, so the earliest M, that what I mean by the earliest M is that if I look, this one starts at M equals zero, this one starts at M equals two, this one starts at M equals zero, this one starts at M equals one, the earliest starting point is zero. That's what I mean by the earliest M. Is M equals zero. Okay. And when M is equal to zero, the coefficient of x to the zero plus r minus one, right? That's what happens when M is zero. I need to go and find the sums that have M equals zero in them. This one's got an M equals zero. So I will have A zero, zero plus r, 0 plus r minus 1. That's the coefficient there when m equals 0. And this one doesn't have an m equals 0, so I won't use that one. And this one has an m equals 0, so that will be minus a 0, 0 plus r. And this one doesn't have an m equals 0, so I won't use that one. So that is the coefficient of x to the 0 plus r minus 1. And that coefficient is supposed to be 0. And a naught's not zero, so I can divide by that. So I divide by a naught, and I get this. And now I can factorize that because they've both got an r in them, so I'll get r outside of r minus one minus one, and I'll get r equals zero and r equals two. Cool. So this thing at this point, this thing here, that's the initial equation. So after you've found the coefficient of x to the power of whatever for the earliest value of m that you can find, and you divide by the a naught, you'll get the initial equation. Sometimes it happens that the earliest value of m that you find is minus 1. And sometimes it happens that the earliest value of m that you can find is 1. It doesn't matter what the earliest one is, as long as it's the first earliest m that appears in any of the sums, that's the one you use. The reason I'm saying it that way is that it doesn't, you don't have to choose m equals 0. It's whichever one happens first is the one that you need to choose. And if you have shifted everything to be m plus r, then it will be m equals zero. Um, but if you've shifted everything differently, it might be something else. Is that all right? Cool. Okay. And then you are supposed to pick your value of r and do the next bit separately for each value of r. It's very eigenvalue-y. Um, that's what you're supposed to do, but you can just keep the value of r as is and do it all in terms of r and sub it in later, and that's usually ever so slightly quicker. Um, in an exam, <clears throat> they may not even get you to do the next bit, right? They'll just get you to set it up. Um, but if, it's, if you had to do the whole process, and um, those of you watching in the future, maybe you're watching this revision seminar just before like assignment five um, in the course, which is about Frobenius's method. Um, so if you have to do the whole process, um, you're supposed to pick whichever of these, um, do it for both of them. If they're an integer apart, you will not get different answers um, and they'll give you the same answer no, um, either way. And so you choose the one that's easier, which is zero. Yeah, so just point some things out. Yep. 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 Yes, I'm going to do that now. So cool. Next stage. So you can pick these, but I'm just not going to pick them. I'm going to run with what I've got. Um, and I'll just get different formulas depending on what R is. So that was the earliest M. It produced this answer here. The next value of M that appears in my sums 
is 1, right? m equals 0 was the first one, m equals 1 is the next one, and that's got a 1, and that doesn't have an m equals 1, it starts at m equals 2. So I'm going to have to do m equals 1 separately, because it doesn't appear in all of the sums. That's the sort of thing that you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. So um, m equals 1 does not appear in all sums. And so I'll have to do it separately. And so I'll get the coefficient of x to the 1 plus r minus 1, which is officially x to the r. And that coefficient, I'll have to go through and find all the ones that have an m equals 1 in there. So m equals 0, the next one is m equals 1. So this does include an m equals 1. And so I will have a 1, 1 plus r, 1 plus r minus 1. That's the coefficient from this one. This one doesn't have an m equals 1. So I'm not going to use that one. This one includes m equals 1 because it's m equals 0, m equals 1, m equals 2, etc. And so I'm going to have minus a1, 1, 1 plus r. And this last one has an m equals 1 as well. And so I'm going to have 3a1 one minus 1. And all of this is supposed to be 0. So I've got a1 times 1 plus r times r minus a1 times 1 plus r plus 3a0. And it looks like I can factorize this out actually. They've both got an a1 times 1 plus r. And I'm left with an r here and a minus 1. Oh, that's fun. And I'm going to move this to the other side. And so a1 is equal to minus 3 a naught over r plus 1, r minus 1. It's a little bit like the recurrence relation that is coming, but it's going to be slightly different to the, pre to the, to the recurrence relation that actually happens. So there, I just want to warn you, sometimes when you do this, you end up with it not referring to a naught at all, and it just tells you that a1 is zero. That's quite common, actually. Um, sometimes um, it'll tell you that a1 is a specific number, um, but usually it tells you that a1 is zero or that a1 is some multiple of a naught. And if r was zero, I would get three a naught. So already this is very interesting. This is telling me that a1 is also calculable from a0. Um, and that is one of the problems with trying to do this um, when your integers are, your solutions are different. So cool. So usually you get two different solutions, one that goes with the a0s and one that goes with the a1s, but we're not going to get two different ones because they all go with a0 ultimately. OK, and so now, now I'm up to m equals 2. Every, every of these sums has an m equals 2 in it. And so for m greater than or equal to 2, the coefficient of x to the m plus r minus 1, I use all four of the sums now. So I had this sum, and I just leave them as m's because it's going to work no matter what the m is, as long as m is more than 2. The other one. And all of this is supposed to be zero. And I've got a wickedly horrible um, recurrence relation because it involves both AM minus one and AM minus two. Funsies. Um, but that's what it is. It's okay. We're all right. We survive. So the goal here is to get the latest m equals to something involving earlier m's. That's the goal here. So the goal is a m for the latest. It might not be an m. It might be an m plus 1. It might be an m plus 2. It doesn't really matter. For the latest m is equal to something involving earlier m's. 
So like m minus one and m minus two and that sort of thing. So the latest m I can see here is am. And so I'm going to rearrange this to get am equals. That's the goal. But if the latest m I saw was m plus one, I would go am plus one equals. Um, yeah. So I'm going to factorize this out. Um, I've got an am and an m plus r. It includes both. These both include an am m plus r. And so I'll be left with m plus r minus 1 and then minus another 1 because that's what's left over plus a m minus 2 times m plus r minus 2 oh, and I can move them to the other side is this too many things at once probably no I'm just going to leave it as it is a m minus 2 m plus r minus 2 plus 3 a m minus 1 equals 0 and so I get a m m plus r m plus r minus 2 there equals a m minus 2 times m plus r minus 2 minus 3 a m minus 1. And so my recurrence relation is that a m is a m minus 2 m plus r minus 2 minus 3a m minus 1 all over m plus r m plus r minus 2 and this thing is called a recurrence relation what it allows me to do is figure out what each of the coefficients a m is from the previous ones it's rare in your assignments in fact I don't think you've seen one where there were two different m's here, but now you know it's possible. Um, but it is rare because they haven't set it up in any of the ones you've got. It's much more common to have something like this, where each one is based on the one that's two steps before. Sometimes it happens that you get it like this, where each one is based on the one that's one step before. So now we have the recurrence relation. Just copying it from the previous page so that I don't have to keep flicking back. What? So. Um, because if I was going to do them both, like if I was going to do both r equals 0 and r equals 2, it's quicker to do this calculation once than twice. That's why I don't tub it in now. So if r equals 0, um, I've got that a... Oh, we also just second, just second, just as a summary, that's the recurrence relation, but we also have, we did also get from earlier um, that... Um, a1 is minus 3a0 over r plus 1, um, r minus 1. Just We did also have that information. And so, if r equals 0, um, the recurrence relations become this. A m, so this is for m greater than or equal to 2. A m equals a m minus two, m minus two minus three a m minus one over m plus r and r is zero, and m minus two like that. I am slightly distressed by the minus two on the bottom there. That's freaking me out. I, I feel like I should have. I, I've done something wrong along the way. Because I'm not going to be able to divide by zero. When m is 2, I'm not going to be able to divide by m minus 2. So I've probably done something wrong. Ah, oh, curses.
Ah, uh, when m is, that's okay. When m is 2, I have to go back to this equation and it will tell me um, nothing. <laughs> cool. I'm going to get an A2 that I can't figure out what it is. That's okay. We'll survive. Cool, I choose R equals 2 then. <laughs> but just so you know, what will happen in this one is that because I can't divide by 2 here, when I go back and investigate the equation for m equals 2, it doesn't actually have a2 in it, so I can't figure out what a2 is. And that just gives me an unknown that I'm going to include in my equations. So I'm going to choose r equals 2 instead. <laughs> And that's going to give me an M there, and an M plus 2, and an M there. M R equals 2, right? Yep, 2. Cool. And also A1 is minus 3 A naught over 2 plus 1, which is 3. 2 minus 1, um, which is minus a naught. Cool. It's much simpler. Okay, so we've got a naught, which we can't figure out because we have to agree because we just know it's not zero. And then a1 is minus a naught. And then a2, according to the formula, is a0 times 2 minus 3 times a1 over um, 2 plus 2 times 2, subbing in 2 into this formula. And that is 2 lots of a0 minus 3 lots of minus a0 over uh, 8. Damn it, I shouldn't have gone across. And so that's two lots of A naught plus three lots of A naught. So that's five eighths of A naught. And then we could continue. I'm going to do only one more. And A3 is um, A. Just a second. A3 is three minus one is one times three minus three lots of A2 over three plus two times three. And so that's three lots of A1 uh, minus three lots of A2 over five, 15. But A1 was um, minus A0 and A2 was five eighths of A0. <laughs> so I'm loving it. Cool. Oh. Why don't we consider the a naught from the other sums that don't index and m equals zero? Um, that's an important question. So you're saying that why don't I look here for m equals zero? Oh, are you saying that if I put m equals two into this, it will give me an a naught? And so why don't I consider that a naught? Is that what you're asking? Cool. Um, the reason you don't is because you're, there's two reasons. One is you're specifically looking at the coefficient of x to the m, um, x to the r minus 1, and the coefficient of x to the r minus 1 doesn't appear here. And also that a naught appears in the later, in the next one that I did. So if you look at this one, when I did m equals 1, I did get an a naught in that formula. And so the a naught that you're missing that does appear when m equals 2 appeared in the later formulas anyway. And so you're not missing all of the a noughts, they appear in the other ones. Does that answer the question?
quick. Um, I'm going to times everything by 8 to get rid of the 8 on the bottom of the top line there. So 20, minus 24A0 minus 15A0 over whatever 15 times 8 is. Well, times 4 would be 60, 120. And so I've got minus 39A0 on 120. Great! And so that means that the first several terms... There was an x squared out the front. So if we go all the way back to the beginning, there's an x to the m plus r out the front of this. So x to the r out the front of this. So I'm just going to rewrite this one step down. There's an x to the r right out the front, so I'm actually going to do that. And the r was 2, so there's an x squared out the front. And then there's an a naught, and then there was a minus a naught times x. And then there was a 3 eighths of a naught, was it 3 eighths? 5 eighths of a naught times x squared. Where was it? Yep. And then there was a minus 39 on 120. Um, a naughts times x cubed plus the rest of it. And so they've all got an a naught in them, so officially I can factorize it out. And you say one solution is y equals x squared 1 minus x plus 5 eighths of x squared minus 39 on 120 x cubed plus other stuff. Yay! If you really hope that you get factorials and stuff. There you go. Cool. Um, and that's what it is. And officially what you're supposed to do, this is just one of the two solutions you need because this is a homogeneous second linear ODE which means in order to solve it, you have to find two linearly independent solutions and then go A of this, A times this plus B times this, and that gives you all the other solutions. And we've got one of them. That The other one comes from the R equals two. Um, if you're really lucky, you'll get both of them from one of the R's because you'll get an A naught times something plus an A one times something, and then it's already number times something plus number times something. Um, and if you're very unlucky, you will not get a new one from the other R either, and you will have to use reduction of order to find the other one. Um, wow. So there you go. But that is how Frobenius's method works. So I've done one that was quite difficult. Um, but now if you can do this, you can do anything. This is my, my hope. Well, I choose to stop there. Thank you very much. And um, I wish you the very best for your exam, which is very close now. <laughs> See ya.